It takes money to sign draft picks. What's the cap look like for the Kansas City Chiefs? What comes next, and how can they be moving around? Welcome to Locked On Chiefs. From the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs, this is the Locked On Chiefs podcast. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to all of you new listeners. This is Locked On, the podcast network, your team every day. We are the Chiefs show. We're free on every platform, including YouTube, where you can like, sub, and hit the bell, as well as all the audios where you can get subscribed and leave us your reviews. We would appreciate that. It's nice of you to make us your first listen. If you would grab another Locked On show, I would appreciate it personally. If you would listen to the draft show, that always goes pretty well. I'm Ryan Tracy, the founder of Rogue Analytics and Performance Consulting. And find me at rogueapc.com, where the athletic mate lives, the drive lives, all the information you need, and use that code Locked On and get yourself a nice discount. You can also find me on the Locked On NFL Draft Show as well as your football. This is Chris Clark. Howdy, sir, and thank you for sharing. Uh, KC Chiefs Corner is right underneath Ryan, if you can see that there. Uh, that's where you can find me. That's where I have articles talking about the salary cap, statistics, analytics. Uh, going to dive into all that in the off season, But right now, it's mostly focused on the salary cap. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today um, when we start looking at what it's going to cost Kansas City to sign their draft class and maybe make some trades. And that's really what I think is the most intriguing part that we always forget about is like, having a slotted salary for draft picks changes what you're doing in terms of overall capital. I don't think it's going to deter anyone from moving up into the top 10. Do you? No, it, for most teams, it won't. Uh, I think it's most teams are going to be in a situation where they have enough cap space uh, to move up in the top 10 if they want to. So it's not going to be that big of a deal. Kansas city. I mean, they're sitting there right now. They have 12 picks and right now it's going to cost them about 5.6 million, almost 5.7. Uh, or closer to 5.6 actually million against the cap for their draft picks to sign. And uh, obviously that doesn't, that's not that big of a deal when you're talking top 51. But one of the things that I want to point out on that is that it's 5.6 to sign the draft picks. Then you need another probably two or 3 million to sign your, uh, you know, your practice squad players. You need a million and a half to bring up the bottom of the roster guys that, you know, when you actually get down past cuts, uh, most teams want to have right. around seven million going into the off season or going into the season, you know, between five and seven million available, so they can sign guys after the season when injuries start to happen. So, uh, always something to watch. Yeah, you know, a little walking around money. You got to have that because yep. the business of an NFL roster doesn't end once camp's over. You got to stay under the cap the whole time, and it gets lost in translation some of those times when those contracts go off the board due to injury or IR or wherever it is. So that, I think, sets up maybe the reluctance of some teams that are really cash-strapped. The Chiefs aren't one of those, so I don't think that this is, puts any kind of bind on what they're willing to do other than the draft capital itself. That's the determining factor for me. Yeah, draft capital or players. I mean, Kansas City could trade players away. I don't see them doing that. But, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that they're in a situation where they couldn't get anywhere and feel bad about what they're going to have to spend cap-wise. Even if you look at the so that, Jaguars, that leaves that part. That's nine million dollars for their class, and their number one pick is is eight million. So even if you want to go all the way up to number one, which obviously Kansas City's not going to do, you could afford that as a chief, you know, for the Chiefs and and for this team. So, and it looks like they're they have an eye on that. I I have to think that the cap was one of the driving factors this year. The fact that they did not restructure and take the roster bonus from Patrick Mahomes means that it's in the forefront of their minds, at least. Um, you got to save room for what you expect to be a Melvin Ingram signing later in the year, right? You got to save room for probably maybe another edge, certainly a possibility at corner, and maybe even another wide receiver, right? Yeah, and there's other things that you need to be watching for as well. You, know, you start talking about Patrick Mahomes' contract. Uh, he's already on the books for $46 million next year. Yes, they have a restructure they could do there, so that's probably what they're going to do. But I do want to also point out, I think when this contract was signed, they were expecting 2022 to be probably closer to $225 million versus $208 million. And COVID really has taken a hit out of this contract specifically. Yeah. It definitely has. And it, it echoes through time, right? As we talked about earlier in the week, it does. with how you stack up your draft picks for some teams to get the future built, the Chiefs have to do that with the cap 
now with this contract, with the Jones contract. There's enough there that they have to be planning out not just a season or two, but three and four and five in order to keep that stacked, especially when you don't know when the high number is going to be or what your budget is. Yeah, it's going to be very hard. I think when you're sitting here looking at it as if we sit right now, COVID-19 is basically over, I think, for the NFL, it seems. At least that's the way it seemed at the end of the season. So I don't think it's going to affect the salary cap in the future as long as there isn't a reoccurrence. So I think that's going to help Kansas City. And I think that you're going to see a huge jump in 2024. I'm really curious to see how big of a jump you have in 2023 because I think it's going to go up still pretty significantly, maybe not near as much as uh, 2024 with the new contracts kicking in. Yeah, it, it could very well be. Now, maneuvering is something that you always have to keep in mind as well because that will be affected. I don't think more get traded myself, but in terms of salary and dedication to that, changing picks does. And as we look forward to what might come from this draft, we're going to get into more some scenarios and, and some of Chris's thoughts on what is likely to happen, maybe what isn't. We'll find out. But if you have a strong feeling yourself, you probably want to put some money down on that and you can do it over at betonline.net. You can find all the sports developments, all the news, all the pods, everything you need from this crazy football offseason, all kinds of draft props and that kind of thing, to the Masters Championships, all the other sports. There's actually a baseball season now, evidently. I was totally unaware until <laughs> yesterday. Um, hockey. <laughs> there's a it's lot there. going on. Yeah, right? Yeah, go watch hockey. Help help, help them. Um, BetOnline, it's your source for all of your information that you need put your money down in a smart way and get it out there on the line so you can make some back head over to the website and check it out with your mobile device or anything else it's bet online where the game starts so tell me where you want to go with this topic you know i think the big question and you were talking about this on tuesday's show was Kansas City moving up to 21 so you want to start there you want to see what it would cost uh the bigger question i i guess i have is if they're going to move up to 21 what do you think it's going to cost them in draft picks? Because I can tell you what it's going to cost them in cap space. And it's not near as much as you would think. Right. And that's, that's what I want to kind of compare. And that's funny because it, it's not, it's a pretty significant cost in terms of draft capital. I think it would cost absolutely them one of the third round picks in order to move up to 21. It might cost them a seventh as well. I, that doesn't necessarily concern me because I don't see them taking 12 picks in this draft. If right. they take nine, I think they're very happy with where they move to get those nine. Well, if they could so, get rid of 103 as opposed scenario. to 94, I think they'd even be more happy, mm -hmm. but it's going to be a big question. Yeah, I mean, you're in going to 21, you're talking about dealing with Bill Belichick. Mm -hmm. Not exactly known for making, you know, super friendly deals. But it is the, the spot in this draft that I feel like if you are looking for wide receiver, if you're – possibly looking for edge like you have to get ahead of some of the teams that are likely just a bit ahead of you that could be looking in that same area the green bay packers for me in particular are also teams that need those two positions same as the chiefs so getting in front of them is going to be what it takes for me so looking at 21 a third and probably a seventh is my guess the charts there's a lot of comparison charts there's there's several models yeah, there's that tons. people have used over the years going all the way back to Jimmy Johnson. There are several more modern. You guys can find those online. I don't subscribe to any of them. They're all they're all estimations because James themselves get desperate. They get needy, and that changes the value they're willing to accept. At the end of the day, this, these are all deals. It's just the art of negotiation, right? So yep. they're guidelines, but I won't say that they're hard and fast. So given, the, given those numbers, if, if we gave up the 103, and one of the sevenths, I think that the impact in terms of cap would be pretty interesting. I don't know if it would be gigantic, though. You tell me. No, it really wouldn't be gigantic. I think you're looking at a cap of really the difference between 29 and 21 is about four $400,000. Sorry. So that's pretty insignificant uh, when you're talking about all the cap space uh, in, you know, four. The third pick, the pick in the third round, uh, if they're looking at 103, you're looking at about 950,000, uh, which is about where you're going to be at 94 as well. It's actually about 965,000. So right around the same amount uh, at that point. So really, I think you're in a situation where if you make those moves, and to be clear, 
all of those are dependent on whether or not uh, if you're talking about top 51, you're still looking at most of the guys that are making like 895,000 against the cap right now. So you're really only talking like 60 or $70,000 for those third round picks. Yeah. I mean, it's very, very yeah. insignificant compared to what it is going to be elsewhere. And, and honestly, you know, you look at the the first round pick, it's, it's insignificant as well. I mean, it's not even, uh, you know, it's $400,000. It's not a large chunk. Now, the players that are available to go to 21-4, I think that's the other part. And we'll talk about the, the maybe the dream scenario here coming up after this next break. But for right now, if we're talking about changing that money, changing those picks, what does that mean? At 21, if you go off my last league-wide mock draft uh, on Locked On Draft earlier this week on the Monday show, that gets you back in the range for Drake London, for Trent McDuffie, for Boye Mafé, for Andrew Booth, for Traylon Burks, Dax Hill, and Dotson are who I actually slotted the Chiefs at 29 and 30. So I, I think you would call probably several of those players upgrades, but that's kind of, of the scenario that we're talking about. Particularly, I like the, the McDuffie and the Drake London options. Um, I do like Booth quite a bit as well. Is there anybody there that you could say, okay, 21's high enough to go get what they want to get? Well, 21 is not going to get you who a lot of Chiefs fans seem to want, and that's James and Williams. I just don't think you're going to get James and Williams at 21. Talk about uh, that. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be much higher right. up. Uh, <laughs> where did the uh, Ohio State receivers go in your mock? Just so we um, can throw it out there. Let's see. Yeah, let me go find that. Uh, Olave at 16. Okay. Garrett Wilson at – where did he go? I think it was 13. Yes. Okay. So you're looking at so those, earlier. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Eight to the Falcons. My fault. Okay. Yeah. And I would imagine your mock didn't really have anything really regarding the, you know, all the QBs that are probably going to go in the top 20 uh, that we discussed on Tuesday, but no. you start looking at uh, what Kansas city could have, uh, you know, maybe they could get one of those wide receivers. Maybe they go get Drake London it's just a question of what they think is the most important. I still think as of right now, as we're recording this, Kansas city gets Bradbury in my mind, if they get Bradbury, they're not making a trade for a corner. Yeah, I, I can understand that. And I would probably agree because that, that shows you the buy-in that they're, they're giving that Bradbury trade. Right. Um, I don't necessarily think that that happens to tell you the truth. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave right. it as a possibility, but what this but, shows you, but is I don't think they're not getting the premium talent. Yeah, and I guess I was just going to say, I don't think that they go into the draft without Bradbury or Gilmore. I think that they do something in a corner because I don't think they want to be desperate for that position. Agree. And I think the veteran gets the nod. Unless Bradbury gets to the point where they just release him and you can sign him off the street. That changes the whole scenario for me. Possibly. So, so. but again, Mc, McDuffie is, I, I think, a very, very good corner. He allows them to play a lot more zone, as would Bradbury. Um a little short in the arm, not that much production. He wasn't targeted very much. The same the soft gardener, a soft gardener uh, disease. When you, when you don't get thrown the ball, it's hard to make plays on the ball. So um, that goes back towards, okay, 21's good. You might be able to get a wide receiver there that you like. You probably haven't upgraded uh, your edge much, except for what we've seen the trend of the Boy Mafes and David Ajabas, who had been low in the 30s, some in the second day now getting pushed up and pushed up and pushed up. The results of that trade the other day should push things back down. So those should be viable picks at 21, but that's, that's not the sexy pick, right? I know I know what you're thinking. I know what all of you are thinking. You want to talk about the guy that runs fast, that does things that Tyree could do. I get that. So after this, we'll get into what what's the dream scenario? What's the best that could happen? And how is it affected by what we saw the other day uh, with that big trade? Uh, with the Eagles and what that does pushing draft picks around. We'll do that when we get back from this. Yes, I know. And for everyone's information, Chris, you don't disagree with me, right? The, the target that you're talking about is Jamison Williams, yes? I think that a lot of people expect the Kansas City is interested in Jamison Williams. I think it's something to wonder about because it sounded like at least Kansas City was really interested in Henry Ruggs a couple years ago. 
and then they did make a move and he went to the Raiders. And obviously that whole scenario is a different story. But to me, it's a question of whether or not they really have interest. If they have interest and they think he's the best wide receiver in this class, do they have the ammo to go up and get him? That's the question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not much of a question to me. I think with 29 and 30, you can get up to where you can acquire him. With what we saw on Tuesday and the whole discussion we had, if you guys missed it, go back and listen to Tuesday, uh, all about why that initial trade happened and what it means for quarterback demand. And as quarterbacks get pushed up, everybody else gets pushed down. That includes Jamison Williams. Now, in, in the last two weeks, he's been going outside the top 10 but generally before the Chargers pick at 17. From what I hear around the league and people who understand some of the teams that are picking in there very well, there's not necessarily that much interest there. So if he, if he falls a little bit because he's artificially pushed down, for me, the target becomes let's call Howie and Brett Veach talks to somebody in Philadelphia and that's the deal that you're trying to strike. So you're trying to get to 16? So... Or just, that's the thought was it 15 it is no it's 15 it's, it's still 15, 15 now yeah it is 15 eagles 16 saints 18 that's eagles right. 19 saints so the 15 pick is what you're thinking because if the chargers do get them i have seen that there is some out interested in, in adding to the mike williams receiving crew i don't think that would be my, my advice to the chargers but i'm not here to give advice to the chargers so we'll just assume that they're going to do something silly like that so getting to 15 is the goal, in my mind, if you want a legitimate shot at getting Jamison Williams if he falls because the quarterback pressure sends him down. So I think it takes 29 and 30. And I think you can maybe hope to recover a fourth. You can maybe squeeze for a flip of thirds. I don't know. I think it's somewhere along those lines. Just to get a shot. That doesn't ensure anything. But at that value in terms of the draft capital, would you do it? If they believe in his health and they think he's going to be a viable option in November and December, then yes. Uh, I think that that kind of changes things. If, if they think he could be somebody that can contribute as they go on their playoff run, absolutely. I think then that's a trade. And I understand when you're looking at draft picks, you don't necessarily look at what they can do year one. Uh, but with this type of scenario where you have two number ones that you're going to be giving up, I think you have to. So generally speaking, as we talked about on Tuesday, you don't make a trade with two number ones unless you're going to go get a QB. Kansas City doesn't need that, but they do need to help their QB, and this is a move that could really do that. And and that also goes into the historical part of it, too. Like They traded a, a good group of picks to get to 10 to get Patrick. Mm -hmm. I can't see them going above that or to 10 again to pick a wide receiver. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me just in terms of the equalized value. But the salary implications of that is what I'm really interested in because if you're talking about 29 and 30 going up to 15, what does that change in terms of what you have to pay out that selection? So funny enough, 29 and 30 combined, uh, you're looking at about a scenario of 2.5 and 2.4. So you're looking at 4.9. You'd actually save money if you went up to the 15, 215 to get in. Yeah. Yeah. You'd save uh, okay. roughly 1.6. 1. 1.6 1. 6 million against okay. the cap in 2022. Seems acceptable to me. If you yeah. get the guy that, uh, especially with MBS on board and Juju on board and McColl's continued development, plus what I think will be some other uh, availability later, like that makes sense. And, and I think you're in a situation where if you do something like that and you make a move like that, and here's the key. This is something you and I talked about in the offseason. We didn't expect it to go to this level because we never expected Tyreek mm -hmm. Hill to get traded. But we right. did talk about the wide receiver group getting rebuilt. And right now, the only wide receiver that's back this year that had any kind of real playing time and experience last year is McCole Hardman. This completely rebuilds that receiving group and gives you four wideouts that I think you can trust to an extent, at least. Uh, I'm still not sold on Hardman, but we'll see how that pans out. Yeah. But with Hardman, MVS, Juju, and Jamison Williams, I think you are sitting there at a great spot for the receiver group. And I think you're also going to be in a position where Williams can step in and he doesn't have to know the full offense. 
he can start doing some of the things that Tyreek did. He can start doing some of the things that McColl's been really good at. Uh, and he can learn that while he's recovering from his injury. Although it sounds like he's really close to being recovered at this point. It does. It does. Now, let me hit you with the last scenario. My favorite, personally. Let's get away from the pretty boys on offense and let's talk about <laughs> stopping somebody. So at 15, in, in my that previous just mock, feel like it puts you in range. It just doesn't feel like Kansas City because they're always an offensive team. But go ahead. Oh, shit. Share it. Yeah, ask me about that after we rewatch a couple of games here from the postseason. Um, they're not going to go not trade after a fullback. Was, it, no, I know that. We got Mike Burton all as well. Um, if you look at it, the way that it fell, which was the most logical from what I've gathered from a bunch of teams and a lot of uh, of people who have actual input with the teams kind of helped me do that mock on Monday. This would put you in range at 15 for a number of impact defenders. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily the top three edges. They're going to be gone. They're going to be gone in the top seven or eight picks unless multiple teams jump into those top seven or eight four quarterbacks. I don't know if I can see that happening. But as it fell the other day, it puts you in range for Jermaine Johnson, the edge. It puts you in range for Jordan Davis. It puts you in range for Devontae Wyatt. It also, I, and I think that because Karloftis will likely be the one that, that, as I understand, the Houston Texans prefer, that's why, even though I had Jermaine Johnson at 13, like it's more likely to be Karloftis, as I understand. It would certainly keep you in play for Devin Lloyd as well. So those are four impact defenders that at 15, you have a reasonable chance of getting at least one of them, if not two or three. Is that for you the value, given what we talked about with the, the salary and everything else? Not unless it's an edge. And the reason okay. I say that edge is only. because, well, the reason I say that is because you have Chris Jones. So going up for Jordan Davis and going up for Devontae Wyatt doesn't make near as much sense to trade away for two first round picks to do that. Uh, to me, you have to go get edge. Edge is the premium position. Defensive tackle is not. Uh, that's what it comes down to for me. And then okay. when it comes to linebacker, you have two second round picks already in that linebacker room. So I, not that not the Devin Lloyd. And you have number player. 50. Right. Yeah, and you could go get a Chad Muma or, yeah. you know, how many other different players that are sitting there that could step in and be that guy, even in the second round. And I know a lot of Chiefs fans would hate that because that seems to be where they're taking the linebackers. But I think it's a great value if, if they can step in and they're a three-down guy. But if you're going to move up for a player, yeah. it's got to be a premium position. It's got to be corner. It's got to be QB, left tackle, or edge. And in this case, we've okay. talked about I wide receiver – but I, I do think it is – I think that's a premium position in, in an Andy Reid offense. It can yeah, be I, I agree. A premium and I agree with you about being one of the, the big four pillars. I'm totally with you there. So it seems a little less likely. The 21 seems like you could get a, a corner or, or possibly a defensive tackle there. So, yeah, so edge or bust if you're going on the defensive side and you're trading up with two of those picks. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. So that's our scenarios – what we could see happening now in, in light of what's going on now. Now, as we record this, somebody will make a trade today and we'll have to start all over. But the scenarios do get based on where you're slotted, the draft capital you give up, and what that cap um, – what do they call that? A designation? They are preconceived contracts, right? Yep. They're pretty much pre-done already. So you could already pretty much guess what their draft capital – or sorry, what their cost is for the draft pool. And I will be tweeting out what the draft cost is going to be for the Chiefs picks during the draft because I will be watching that because I'm curious like that. Rock and roll. Folks, so, let us know what you think. Would you want them to trade? And if so, up to 21, up to 15, or up something crazy, let us know in the, the YouTube comments. I would love to see them. And if you'd leave the, uh, the reviews over there on iTunes and Spotify, we can read them there as well. I hope that you guys enjoyed this. As, as we're getting a little bit more into the theory here as we – we're waiting for this draft to happen. So if you are new to the YouTube channel, make sure you like, sub, and hit that bell. And otherwise, we will say until tomorrow when we will have more for you. Thank you for listening today. We'll talk to you then.